Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. The end of the 2009 fall semester is literally days away, and the focus of attention at BCC shifts to the holiday season. But on the horizon is the spring 2010 semester. BCC students often rely on faculty in advising them on their course schedule. And that advice, in many cases, focuses the student on taking the courses required to graduate. But last month, the college held an event where students were able to learn of courses which may be of interest to them, yet may not be required to complete their major. For years, the Division of Humanities has sponsored a day where students can learn course offerings in the spring, which are considered not traditional. Organizer Chris Ann Souza thought that for this year, a good idea would be to expand the concept to all academic divisions of the college. That resulted in some 20 organizations taking part in the first campus-wide course fair. Sousa says other colleges and universities conduct course fairs as a way to introduce students to topics with which they may not be familiar. The sad truth is that very often um, when I mention certain programs or courses, even within my classroom, most students are like, wow, I did not know we had that. And I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's difficult to communicate with everyone. You know, everybody is competing. Um, for a student or even for other faculty's attention to participate in things. So a fair like this does give the kids um, a chance to discover things that they might not otherwise have um, heard about. So that, that's really the purpose because, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to get the word out there. Um, so here's the chance to, you know, do it in a big way. <laughs> Sousa was on hand to promote one-time English courses such as short story writing and African-American women's literature. She says it's these unique offerings that will sometimes direct a student toward their future career. Particularly with an associate's, uh, you're moving on. This is also an opportunity for a lot of students to explore. Um, a lot of times students will come in in general studies or perhaps they come in with the idea that they have one focus in mind, but like most college students, that very often changes. Um, and it's through discovering other possibilities or unique courses that sometimes kids do find their true passion. I know for myself um, that was true. I never would have imagined being a writer initially. Um, and it was, uh, you know, through a great class that got me intrigued, that, you know, set me on my path. So it's um, it serves a lot of purposes, helps them have a you know, more rounded education and more options. Megan Abella Bowen was on hand to promote offerings for engineering technology students. We've got a variety of different courses happening this semester or in the spring semester. Uh, several in our new marine technology program. The first one is the one that we ran last year, which is ETK 90. It's a projects course, and the students actually focus on building an ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle that they build, they design, and they build from scratch, and then they compete in a competition in the spring semester. So it's a great way to pull all the engineering design process in and allow the kids to have an applied experience. The second course is a marine trades course that we're teaching that is going to be an inboard motors course. It allows them to get the hands-on um, experience of doing all the mechanical work on the inboard motor and it's part of our four course uh, four courses that make up the marine trade certificate. Second year engineering student Steve Sadek attended the fair and was pleased to find these expanded options. I knew about a few of the classes here, hence I looked in the handbook, seen all the classes available, and I was unsure on what this class actually was, so I learned about this class today, and it's basically showing to reinforce CNC milling and introduce you into it if you haven't been introduced into it, and if you have a background, they can actually help you further the education. Abella Bowen says these specific offerings do not just go a long way to diversifying students' transcripts, they also offer experience which can translate to real-world opportunities. In the engineering field, there's still a lot of jobs out there. So even in a tight economy, there's opportunities with a two-year associate degree in an engineering electronics field, in a mechanical field, in a civil field. So that's the first thing. There's opportunities out there if you can get in here and even do one of our certificates. But the second one is this whole marine field that we're pushing. There are a lot of hidden jobs in the marine technology field. We're on the coast. We've got schools like UMass Dartmouth, MIT. Then we've got NOAA, Woods Hole. And then we've got all the big companies like Teledyne, 
Pipeline, Benthos, Ocean Server, they're all here. They're constantly looking for people. Our students are trying to get internship opportunities there, co-op opportunities. So again, getting the word out that we have these kind of programs and that our students can take advantage of them, I think is a really key aspect. It really will get them out there in the working world um, with skill sets that they need to go to work right away. The spring 2010 semester begins January 25th. You can find out all the credit and non-credit course offerings at all BCC campuses by going to the college's website, bristolcc.edu. On November 19th, the college and the country celebrated the 33rd annual Great American Smokeout. And as part of the celebration, BCC announced that it's prepared to make its campuses completely smoke-free. At a presentation on the hazards of secondhand smoke, BCC President Dr. John Sprague made the announcement that the college plans to become completely smoke-free by June of 2010. President Sprague says the decision to go smoke-free followed a deliberate examination of the issues. It's been a inclusive process. We want to vary, as president, I must be aware uh, of the rights of smokers as well as non-smokers. Uh, we don't want to make any arbitrary decisions. Uh, so we've had a number of conversations and uh, the health, uh, the medical evidence is uh, overwhelming uh, about the dangers of smoke, uh, whether it's secondhand or uh, uh, directly smokers. Uh, so we feel on balance that it's best to promote the healthy environment at the, uh, at the college, all locations, and to move toward a smoke-free uh, environment. Part of the discussion focused on a survey held earlier this year which showed that 53% of those on campus were seriously concerned about smoking at the college. Jerry Hamill, nursing coordinator of Learning Resources, says the moderate disapproval of smoking may not have included all segments of the college community. The survey uh, captured data from about 670 students. Um, I don't know that the faculty and staff um, completed the survey. And I'm wondering if, in fact, this, the uh, survey results might have been more impressive if uh, faculty and staff had had an opportunity or uh, in our busy schedules had had a moment to indicate their feeling. And it's certainly my hope that by presentation, uh, it's time for BCC to be smoke-free. We'll provide information um, to individuals here on campus, visitors, students, and faculty alike, um, that will educate them to the risks of secondhand smoke exposure. Hamill has taken the lead in developing an information campaign that will make BCC smoke-free. She says studies show that a smoke-free environment will not only improve the health of all on campus, but also plays a role in a smoker deciding to quit. College-age smokers are much more likely to quit um, on a campus that is smoke-free, uh, and they're much more likely to be respectful in their smoking habits if they choose to continue to smoke in a campus that's smoke-free. And there's significant research that indicates a smoke-free campus does do something to prevent those college-age students from beginning to smoke. Hamill says making the college smoke-free is the best way to accommodate smokers and non-smokers. If you talk to a smoker, they feel that if they had a designated area, it would be easier. Um, a couple of things I'd like to challenge that concept with is, one, the only way to protect a non-smoker from secondhand smoke is to eliminate smoking. There is no safety in designated smoking areas. My other thought is that in these economic times, it's somewhat ridiculous to invest money in designated smoking areas when we're on our way, just as the community around us is, to smoke free. I think investing in a designated smoking area is detrimental based on the fact that we just don't have the monies in this day and age. Um, but it doesn't protect the smoker. No matter where you put designated smoking areas here on our beautiful campus, someone is going to have to walk by it and they're at risk. President Sprague believes that the Great American Smokeout is a great way to focus people on the hazards of smoking, but the college will use that day as a springboard to continue to talk about the issue going forward. And I think the important thing is that it gives us some time to continue with our education uh, program about the dangers of smoke, uh, the dangers of use of tobacco, uh, and our uh, staff, uh, a wonderful staff, uh, working to provide uh, handouts and uh, workshops and even hypnosis of, of projects uh, to try to uh, convince people about the dangers of smoking, convince people who are smoking to give it up 
and uh, reinforce for non-smokers the idea don't start. So the educational process, uh, this would be a wonderful opportunity in the interim between today's Great American Smokeout Day and next June, 10, uh, June 7, 2010, will be a time for us to continue and of course we won't stop after that either. We'll continue the process of education. That's what we're all about on the campus. By the way, the date that BCC is set to become smoke free, June 7, 2010, was chosen because it's considered the first day of classes in the college's new academic year. Next up, those on campus in early November were treated to a visual display of an historical art form coordinated by BCC's Fine Arts Department. Iron casting as an art form dates back upwards of 2,000 years. Eric Durant, coordinator of BCC's Fine Arts program and a sculptor himself, wanted to give students the experience of casting iron after seeing an exhibition from a group of professional artists who perform iron pours and casting workshops across New England. After securing a grant from the BCC Foundation, Durant was able to sponsor BCC's own iron pour last month. It's something that, uh, that people have been doing for a long time. Um, as long as people have been casting iron, um, people have been casting art objects in iron. Um, various different um, uh, uh, things can, can be cast from utilitarian objects to, uh, to sculptures. Um, most of what we cast in the pour were, uh, were various low relief um, uh, plates. Um, um, you know, like plaques, not plates. Um, so there were uh, there were a whole bunch of different uh, um, things that, that can be can be made out of out of iron. Students who took part in the iron pour first created a template out of clay, then developed a mold made from a sand and resin mixture. The students were extremely receptive. Uh, everybody was very excited about this. I, I think, uh, you know, sort of moving beyond um, doing sort of small scale castings and some of the things that we were able to do to something that was um, really big, um, uh, really, really public, um, and just uh, really exciting. I mean, there's something about, there's something about fire that, uh, and molten metal that just um, appeals to us as human beings. Mm -hmm. So I, I know very few people who don't seem to get excited about molten metal. <laughs> Student Tony Paiva was inspired by the possibilities provided by the art of metal casting. You can express yourself in so many different ways with colors of, um, you know, steel, using steel, bronze, aluminum, you could even go with brass. Um, it's just you can get various different tones and textures. I mean, between being polished and unpolished, there's a lot you can do with it, I think. Dozens of people came to BCC to see the iron pour, despite the cool temperatures. Durant feels that the event's success could lead to it being an annual event. It is my goal to make this an annual event. So uh, I am trying to build a culture of iron casting here in the Fall River area. Um, I think this is something that's uh, a little bit unique. Um, it's something that, uh, that could easily revolve around uh, a campus culture um, and could be something that people maybe look forward to. Uh, and, you know, oh, when, are, when is BCC doing its annual iron pour this year? Um, it's something that, that the public could come to. Um, maybe we could use it as a... Um, as a way to reach out to some of the high schools and whatnot. We did that this year. We, uh, we sent flyers out, uh, or we spread flyers around to the high schools and invited people to come in. Um, and uh, I don't know how many actually came, but uh, in order to see, you know, wow, that, you know, this is a good option coming to BCC. There's a lot of exciting stuff that's going on here. Durant feels the iron pour will not be the only metal castings being done on campus. He has plans to explore how other metal pours can be incorporated into the fine arts curriculum. Time now for another edition of Alumni in Your Community. This month we talked to a man who has succeeded in completing his education despite being visually impaired. Hi, I'm Bob Branco from the class of 1981. I was born and raised in the city of New Bedford. I am proud to be a resident of New Bedford actually. My blindness, from what I understand, was a direct result of optic atrophy. I had more sight when I was a child than I do today. I was able to identify shapes, colors, night and day, the sun, the moon, the clouds. Uh, and I learned that at a very young age. I was tested 
by several doctors to determine how much vision I had. As a child, I went to public school and spent time in a sight-saving class in the 60s. By the fifth grade, the state of Massachusetts took over and decided that there was nothing more they could do for me at that particular time in the New Bedford area. So I was then sent to the Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, where I finished my middle and high school education. I graduated in 1977. I guess when I was a senior in high school, that was one of the options that I was told about where I could go um, you know, as a, as a postgraduate of high school. It was a junior college. I would be able to start there, get my feet wet, establish some credit there, take courses, get an associate's degree there. And I later realized that that was the right thing for me to do because it was a stepping stone between high school life and that of regular hands-on um, university life. I took a year off after high school, not by choice. I tried to take a couple of courses at BCC right away, but they ended up being the wrong course. So I decided to take a year off and start fresh in the fall of 1978. I majored in business, so I took some business courses, and then I took a couple of other courses as electives, such as social science, history, psychology, things like that. Um, and I took at first two courses in the semester, then I went to three, and then from there on I had four courses per semester, including summer school courses. One of the first things that I did upon arriving at BCC was to check and make sure that there was a place to go on the campus for persons with visual impairments. And when I was satisfied with the resources, I suddenly discovered I would have no problem uh, uh, going to an office where they would help me out with the transition, help me make things more accessible, um, help me with certain issues that the professors had trouble with, uh, getting my books transcribed, getting lessons transcribed into tape so that I could, uh, you know, learn better, uh, make readers available for me to do studying between classes. Uh, I found that the services at BCC on that level were very satisfactory. In 1981, I started attending UMass Dartmouth, which was then called SMU. I went in there as a junior with most, if not all, of my credits from BCC transferred into the SMU curriculum for me. Then I graduated in 1983 from SMU with a degree in finance. I've done things such as telemarketing, um, computer work, uh, reception, uh, counseling for the elderly, uh, auto parts manager for an auto dealer, and things like that. I worked at a switchboard for one or two months as well. So I have done a lot of things. I was very diverse in my job activities. And uh, as I said, uh, I was never fired, nor did I ever quit a job. Where it was so difficult for me to find jobs in the first place, I had to resort to more creative means to be able to get the jobs. Because traditional methods, given my disability, weren't working all the time. So I had to come up with other ways to find a job, either through the buddy system, through advertising my own skills in the newspaper, on the radio, on television, so that employers can understand that a blind person can do the job. Many employers don't get it yet, and that's through no fault of their own. It's just lack of education on their part. I run a bowling league for handicapped and non-handicapped people every Sunday morning at the Wonder Bowl in New Bedford. I've been doing that for a lot of years. I also run a slow pitch softball league. It's not a specialized league, it's a regular league for people who want to participate. We play our games in Dartmouth. Uh, we have about nine teams. And I've been running the league now. It's going to be, well, almost four years now. I had one of the best times of my life at BCC as a visually impaired student. As a student, generally, I made a lot of friends. All my classes were in one building. We all seemed to have a routine. 
as far as where to meet later on, where to socialize. Uh, you know, the professors were always available in their offices. Uh, I can't say that about the SMU professors, by the way, but the BCC professors were always in their offices when they weren't teaching. If I had a problem, I would knock at the professor's door and chances are, if he wasn't teaching, he'd be there to answer my question. It was a great time at BCC. I sincerely missed it. Mr. Branco has detailed his challenges of being visually impaired in a new book, which is available locally. With the holidays here, let's check in once again with our friends at the BCC Culinary Arts Department as they share with us a recipe for holiday cookings and a hot drink to go along with them. Happy Holidays from Bristol Community College. My name is Chef Gloria Cabral and today I will be demonstrating gingerbread cookies and today joining us will be Chef Stephen Hoban who will show you some little holiday cheer. What we're learning to do is making our creaming method of cookies. Most of our holiday cookies are done by mixing your sugars and your fats together to get a nice crispy crunch. What I did is I put in my sugar and my brown sugar together and I'm adding some molasses. A lot of times I do all my measuring in little plastic containers because I don't like to do dishes so it's much easier to throw a little bit away. I do all my measurements and everything in plastic and we throw it away. You need to first mix all your sugars together. Molasses, brown sugar and white sugar. As that comes together I will add my fat. In this case it'll be shortening. Some recipes call for butter or margarine. and this will help us aerate our dough to give us a nice crunch. We'll mix this to it's nice and light and fluffy. The next thing you would do is add your room temperature eggs one at a time so they're all incorporated. Once your eggs are mixed nice and smooth, I'll add my flour and all my spices, which I've already sifted, in three stages. See, by using the plastic, no extra dishes. This way you spend all the time with your family and less time in the kitchen. There we go. Always try to keep your work area nice and clean. And I usually mix my dough till it just comes together because I don't want to over mix my flour in there because I want a nice tender cookie. And our dough is basically done. What I will do now is ref Roll, put this on a sheet pan with a little piece of parchment and refrigerate it. I took all my dough and I rolled it out on a nice piece of parchment paper and refrigerated it the si thickness that I want for my cookie. So the easiest thing is to do all my little cutouts, press them right in, make sure I leave enough space so they expand, have all my little I want to keep my cookies on there and take off the extra that I can re-roll later for another cookie dough. So what I do is, now I have all my cookies ready to go in the oven. I don't have to move them, it doesn't warm up, so it's nice and easy, and we will bake them. And then put it right there. Now while they're baking, we'll go off to see, meet Chef Hoban and see what he's doing with his delicious coffees. Hi, my name is Stephen Hoban. I'm a chef instructor here at Bristol Community College where I'm part of a great culinary arts program that we have here. Today for the holidays, I'm gonna be making a Cafe Diable, which is a nice dark coffee. 
um, filled with, we have triple sec and we have a nice cavassier, and then there's infused with orange peel, lemon peel, cinnamon stick, brown sugar, and finished with whipped cream. The first thing I wanted to do is get my flame and I'm going to put, be putting it, heating it, tempering it into a copper pot. That'll only take about 10 seconds or so, okay? You could do this at home in a pot. You don't have to ignite it like I'm going to be doing. You can just put the liquor in at the end, or you can put it in at the beginning. I'm just doing this for a show because it's a table side item, usually. At this point, make sure you always use a side towel because it's very hot. Copper conducts heat. I'm going to be putting the brandy in. Then I am just going to tip this just a little bit, and that'll make a nice flame. Okay. At this point, I'm going to be adding my lemon peel. So you can see how well that flame's going my orange peel, a cinnamon stick, that'll cook for another 30 seconds or so. Then I'm going to be adding some ground cinnamon. And you can see for table side, that picks a little spark and it puts on a nice shell for everyone to see. And that's just about coming to the end. I'm going to be adding my hot coffee. I'm going to add about eight to 10 ounces. Okay. That's going to come to a boil. And then last, brown sugar. That's going to come to a quick simmer, and that should take about 30 seconds or so. At that point, I'll get my cups ready for service. This will serve two people, two guests. And that's just about coming to the simmer. Have my whipped cream here, which I pre-made. Okay, and that should be just about there. I'm gonna turn the flame off. And then I'm gonna ladle this in to the cup. And then I will be topping that with whipped cream, which goes right on top like that. And just a little bit of a dusting of some cinnamon. And there you have it, there's your Cafe Diable for the holidays. Also, I would be able to, if you would like to add some coffee to any one of these liqueurs, from the left you have Bailey's, which would make a Irish coffee added to coffee, or Kahlua for a Mexican coffee, or you would have an Amaretto di Sirono for an Italian coffee. And that concludes our demonstration. Happy holidays. Hope you enjoyed our segment with Mr. Hoban making these wonderful uh, Cafe Diablos to have with the different types of cookies you can make over the holidays. Using our basic creaming method, you can come up with all these different styles for gingerbread houses. Have a wonderful holiday season. And that's all for Around BCC this month. I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great holiday season and a better 2010.